Good evening, Section Z. Uh, this evening, we're going to continue on in the Duke Minier text, Chapter 11 on zoning, and we're ready for a discussion of zoning regulations relating to household composition. So we've noted that uh, zoning authorities often have areas zoned for single family residential use. And if you're gonna have that kind of a regulation in place, then at some point you're gonna to have to define what is single family residential use? What does it mean to have a single family residing in a dwelling? Um, and so let's pull up the case that they've given us to look at. Uh, this is a case from Washington State and it is uh, called Oxford House, or City of Edmonds versus Oxford House, Inc. And Edmonds had, uh, an ordinance that defined a uh, single family dwelling as uh, a family is persons related by genetics, adoption, or marriage, or a group of five or fewer unrelated persons. And so if you had a house in a single family uh, residential zone, then you could have any number of people living in the house as long as they could prove that they were genetically related, related by adoption, related by marriage, or you can have up to five people living in the house if they couldn't demonstrate those kinds of relationships. This actually is a fairly generous definition. You, you will find uh, many zoning ordinances that define single family as um, persons related by genetics, adoption, or marriage, or such, um, or a group of no more than two unrelated persons. Uh, and so this one was a little bit uh, more permissive than, than you might find in some other jurisdictions. Um, but the ordinance is being challenged by Oxford House, which is an organization that runs group homes for individuals who are recovering from alcohol or drug addictions. Uh, and the basis for the challenge is the Fair Housing Act, specifically the prohibition on dis discrimination based upon handicap. Uh, the parties have stipulated that individuals who are recovering from addiction are handicapped within the meaning of the Fair Housing Act. And so that kind of triggers then the question of whether the city has to make reasonable accommodations uh, to allow this group home to exist in a single family residential neighborhood. Um, Oxford House claims that uh, the group home has to have at least uh, eight to 12 residents in order to be financially viable and also for therapeutic reasons. It's better for the recovery process if they have eight to 12 people living there and that therefore relaxing the city's zoning ordinance uh, to allow the group home in the single family neighborhood would be a reasonable accommodation under the Fair Housing Act. Uh, the city defends based upon an exemption within the Fair Housing Act. Um, there is an exemption that, uh, that uh, pr covers zoning ordinances that uh, designate the maximum number of people who can live in a particular dwelling. Um, and so that's quoted over here on uh, the next page. They say the sole question before the court is whether Edmund's family composition rule qualifies as a quote, restriction regarding the maximum number of occupants permitted to occupy a dwelling within the meaning of the FHA's absolute exemption. If it qualifies, then the FHA does not uh, forbid that particular zoning regulation. Uh, and so this issue had been litigated in the lower federal courts, had made its way up to the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth for the Ninth Circuit out on the West Coast. And the Ninth Circuit decided that uh, Edmund's family composition ordinance did not fall within this exemption of the Fair Housing Act. But if you look up uh, here in this paragraph, uh, a little bit above Roman numeral two, um, they tell us that the, the Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals decision um, the Ninth Circuit's decision conflicts with an 11th Circuit decision declaring exempt under 3607B1, uh, a family definitions provision similar to the Edmonds prescription, C. Elliott versus Abrams. And you will recognize the 11th Circuit is the circuit that we are within, and uh, I'm sorry, Elliott versus Athens. Uh, you'll recognize that uh, Athens is the city where we are located. And in fact, this is a case that came out of Athens. Um, the Supreme Court, the most common reason 
that it takes a case is because there is a conflict of authority in the lower courts, particularly between two federal courts of appeals or perhaps two state Supreme Courts on precisely the same legal question. So they see one of their principal roles as kind of maintaining uniformity in the, the uh, definition of federal law. And so here, uh, the 11th Circuit had a case coming from Athens. Uh, the uh, Athens case had to do with the group called Potter's House. You may have seen the Potter's House thrift store out on Prince Avenue if you drive out that way. Um, and if you keep driving further on uh, and head towards Jefferson, there is a large um, Potter's House facility outside of the city limits of Athens a, a good bit, uh, where I think they have over 100 people who are in uh, a recovery, uh, addiction recovery uh, program out there. Um, but the Potter's House wanted to open a group home in Athens itself in a single family residential neighborhood and ran into the same problem with the definition of single family. And uh, they lost in the 11th Circuit on this particular issue. Um, the 11th Circuit decided that this that the particular Athens ordinance was exempt in the Fair Housing Act. And so because of the conflict in uh, Court of Appeals decisions, the Supreme Court takes the case to resolve the conflict uh, about the meaning of the Fair Housing Act. Um, and so the Supreme Court decides that the Ninth Circuit got it right, the Eleventh Circuit was wrong. Uh, the Fair Housing Act exemption does not apply to an ordinance like this one that restricts use to a single family and then defines a single family um, because the family ordinance does not set a maximum number of occupants. You could have 25 people all living in one house if they can demonstrate that they are related by genetics, uh, adoption, or marriage. Um, and so it, the uh, Supreme Court decides that that was not the kind of provision that the exemption is supposed to protect. Um, the types of exemptions that are protected under this provision of the Fair Housing Act are uh, illustrated by another provision of the Edmonds Code that set a maximum number of occupants based upon floor area of the building. That is uh, the kind of restriction that sets a maximum number of occupants and therefore cannot be challenged under the Fair Housing Act. Um, now, finding that this exemption does not apply is not the end of the case. It doesn't mean that Edmonds necessarily has to allow the group home in a single family residential neighborhood. It just means that they're now, have to, they're now going to have to go back to the lower courts and litigate over the question of whether the Fair Housing Act reasonable accommodation requirements were violated by their enforcement of that zoning rule. Um, there are other cases uh, dealing with group homes uh, in, uh, in other jurisdictions. So the Eighth Circuit, uh, which is kind of in the middle of the country, had a case uh, it, where Oxford House was suing the city of St. Louis, trying to open a group home there. Um, in that case, the Eighth Circuit uh, reached an interesting conclusion that the group home could not claim a failure to provide reasonable accommodations since they had not applied for a variance. Um, and so basically the Eighth Circuit reasoned, uh, reasoned that if you didn't apply for a variance and ask the city not to enforce its rule, you haven't given them the opportunity to, uh, to give you a reasonable accommodation and therefore your suit is premature until you apply for a variance and it gets turned down. Um, so one question that the authors ask in, in uh, the larger version of the book is what if neighbors brought, bought a home in order to prevent it from being used as a group home? So you have a single family residential neighborhood um, and one of the owners is talking about selling their house to uh, an organization like Oxford House that wants to start a group home and the other neighbors contribute money and, and offer a higher bid and buy the house so that it won't get used for that purpose. Um, in a case like that that was challenged under the Fair Housing Act, the court found that the seller was exempt under the Fair Housing Act exemption. Uh, the, remember, the exemption provision included an exemption for people selling uh, 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 the owner of a single family home selling a single family home. Um, and they also decided that the Fair Housing Act did not apply to the neighbors 
uh, they found insufficient evidence of congressional intention to allow uh, Fair Housing Act claims against people who purchase uh, housing with discriminatory, discriminatory motives. Um, they just didn't, they weren't convinced that that was what Congress was trying to regulate. Um, now, what if you had some neighbors who filed a lawsuit in state court trying to prevent a group home by enforcing, say, for instance, uh, restrictive covenants that apply to the neighborhood? Could filing a lawsuit itself be a violation of the Fair Housing Act? Um, that's a kind of a tricky issue because the neighbors also have some protected rights at stake, including a c protected constitutional right to petition the government for a redress of their grievances. Um, so the, uh, the issue of whether and how you can regulate family household composition uh, has been challenged not just on Fair Housing Act grounds, but there have also been constitutional challenges raised to that kind of ordinance. Um, and so uh, there was a case in the Supreme Court called Village of Beltaire versus Barras. Um, and that was a case where uh, you had a limit on the number of occupants who are unrelated who could live, uh, no more than two could live in a house. And it was challenged by some students uh, who were going to a local college and wanted to live together in the house. Um, the court upheld the zoning ordinance, defining a single family as no more than two unrelated persons, deciding that that was rationally related to a government interest in controlling housing density. Um, then later, the Supreme Court had a different constitutional challenge. In this case, you had, uh, it was Moore versus City of East Cleveland, um, and the city had a more restrictive definition of family in its ordinance, and under their definition, it made it impossible for a grandmother to live together with two of her grandchildren from different children. So even though they were related genetically, uh, under this definition of family, uh, the, the housing arrangements were not permitted. And in that case, the Supreme Court decided that the ordinance was unconstitutional, where it was uh, interfering with a grandmother's uh, ability to live with multiple grandchildren through different lines. Um, so Athens, as we noted, does have single family residential zoning, and it has uh, I think different definitions of what that means in different parts of the city, but there are places that are fairly restrictive. And so there is kind of a perennial issue about uh, students living in single family residential neighborhoods. Every once in a while, you will see that issue flare up and the city will kind of get more vigorous in enforcing those uh, provisions. Um, often it's because the students are kind of rowdy or noisy or, or um, you know, have too many cars or something like that. Um, but it is a, an occasional source of controversy within Athens when the city tries to enforce its single family residential zoning. Um, so that's a good stopping point. We will have one more lecture in this chapter on exclusionary zoning.